So, hello everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Welcome to our final session here today. We will have the chance to discuss about new frontiers in science diplomacy and perhaps we can also venture a few glimpses into the future and talk about some foresight ideas in this very brief session. Um, before we start, let me just say I was really highly impressed by your work. I really enjoyed being amongst the first readers who had the chance to get some, got, get some insights into your work. And um, it was, uh, I enjoyed really much also the debate this morning and also last night. And I, it was a pleasure to see how much you already connected. And um, I guess we will just proceed on this thought. Um, we just learned about um, Japan, Japan's disaster resilience dip diplomacy using science diplomacy to foster international cooperation in crisis and disaster management. Annette Wu just um, introduced us to an online exchange program for health profession students aimed at promoting science diplomacy by enabling cross-cultural understanding. Both approaches, um, I guess that became pretty clear, emphasize the importance of international cooperation and the sharing of scientific knowledge to build resilient societies, societies and to foster international mutual understanding, which is, by the way, or which are, um, by the way, pretty much core elements of science diplomacy, I would say. Which leads us to further scientific areas in which science diplomacy has become increasingly relevant. You know it already, artificial inter intelligence and space exploration. New technologies within these fields are raising new geopolitical, soci social and ethical questions amongst others. Moreover, and obviously, all these fields are closely interlinked. Um, artificial intelligence adds an essential new layer, as we already saw today, as it plays a key role both in space exploration and challenges for, I would say, diplomacy itself, as well as in communication. I would like to start by asking you uh, in a first round briefly to present your work and your main hypothesis. In the following discussion, we will maybe figure out uh, how the future trends and challenges, including research security, could look like. So I would like to start with you, Francisco. I already warned you. <laughs> you mentioned in your chapter on space diplomacy and international collaboration that outer space is a domain where states with disparate national interests can identify common ground. Now I was wondering, international cooperation in space like with the ISS often serves as a model of rather peaceful, highly responsible and well recognized collaboration. But looking back from what I read in your chapter, this has not always been the case. What are the reasons for the critical role of space diplomacy in the past? And what are maybe the lessons learned? Tell us about your findings, please, and how does space diplomacy uh, look like today, like the new space age, uh, the new space age, and how was it, for example, in times of the Cold War? Okay, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, nice to be here. Um, great uh, discussion early today in the group. Um, space is one of those domains that um, has a, a lot of uh, interest, public interest. Um, <clears throat> countries have been driving this industry for a long time. Uh, and in the 20th century, we have uh, great uh, examples of that cooperation, right? How space diplomacy was one of the key elements uh, between different countries. Essentially, uh, the US and the Soviet Union at that moment, they were driving that uh, competition, but at the same time, we have great examples of cooperation. So you may remember uh, the International Physical Year was in 1957, even before the, the launch of Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite, um, and different countries were able to create this forum, scientific forum of discussion. Uh, in 1962, uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev uh, both were able to make an agreement for exchange data of information from satellites. And they went to the United Nations in, in December 1962 and make up an official and formal presentation. Um, in 1975, we have the chance to create the, the first joint mission between the Soviet Union and the US, was the, the Apollo-Soyuz test project. And for just a few, few minutes, 
we have a handshake between an astronaut and a cosmonaut in the outer space and what's kind of a relief here on the Earth because reduce the tensions between the superpowers. And I can, I can mention so many of those, and we are right now in the International Space Station and at this very moment that we are here and in the middle of uh, some geopolitical tensions in the international system, at this very moment we have seven, uh, four astronauts and three cosmonauts in, uh, working together in the International Space Station. So space was always a mechanism for cooperation and what we call a space diplomacy that could be a kind of a subtype of, of a science diplomacy could be considered a great mechanism for the future in order to reduce tension with some countries that have conflict but also to encourage long-term partnership with others. Thank you very much. I was wondering about uh, your remarks, or your remark just right now about the subchapter. Is space diplomacy really a subchapter, or is it more like a model? <laughs> I don't know if that. I want to say we, we have this conversation with Annette before. Because there are other like there's uh, health diplomacy, there is um, space diplomacy. Obviously, in your case, there are also all sorts of. AI diplomacy, so I, I've been working, uh, I've been part of a working group in, uh, for the European Commission and uh, also in this group we debated about the relationship from like certain sp specific topics towards, the, the, is this maybe the main topic of uh, science diplomacy, what is the relation, I, I would, like when I read your chapter I was more assuming that space diplomacy is at the core or maybe just a model for everything else that uh, came up. Uh, the answer is, is yes for me. I, I agree with that. Uh, I want to say science diplomacy and space diplomacy, um, I'm not going to say it's a, it's a new phenomenon. And we have a discussion um, earlier about if we have a definition, a common definition, even a theoretical level about that. I don't think we have at this point. But I think the most relevant uh, as a st uh, um, in terms of a space diploma the diplomacy as a mechanism is what is changing is the international system. So we are moving to a more multipolar, more conflictive, and more complicated international system. And what we are seeing is how we are using those mechanisms that we have used in the past in a new way. Because what is changing is, is the, empirical, uh, the empirical landscape. How we are using some tools that in the past were worthy in a different context, in a new way. And that's a big part of the chapter is how it's going to be the new role of space diplomacy in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. No, Christian, your chapter is on how artificial intelligence policy is reshaping science diplomacy. Very promising title, by the way. There's a strong focus on leveraging AI for the public good while ensuring its responsible de deployment. You mentioned that understanding AI and science diplomacy is critical within the context of geopolitical competition. Well, how can we still cooperate? And what is the current state of the discussion? Uh, thank you very much. So I'd like to take a step back first and think what makes a science diplomacy in AI and AI regulation specifically unique? So there's three factors that I think about and identify. One is that AI regulation is highly technical. It requires a lot of in-house expertise, a lot of technical knowledge, which creates both inequities between countries, but also requires, it sets a high bar for uh, the offices and for the people and groups that do the regulation. The second is that countries around the world are very keen and eager to shape AI policy. They want to be able to guide what AI will look like in the coming decades. What this means means different things for different countries, but there's a desire by countries to shape what AI will look like. At the same time, the third point is that AI has a lot of promises and benefits potentially for different countries, and countries have an incentive, in, the, in many countries' views, to keep talent in-house, to approach it from a very much so a national perspective. So there's this tension between this desire to shape through global mechanisms and at the same time, this very sort of national, techno-nationalist uh, approach, which some might advocate for AI. In the, the, the chapter that I wrote, I looked at two different cases which examined the role of science diplomacy and AI regulation. 
The first is the EU-US Trade and Technology Council, which was set up in 2021 to provide a dialogue for the European Union and the United States to discuss areas of common interest and to try and use this dialogue to achieve some policy change in those areas. You've seen this, for example, in export rules. And in, there's been a continuous dis, uh, inclusion of AI in, these, in this dialogue, including a 2022 joint roadmap for AI risk and for regulating AI risk. This included significant expert input by technical experts and scientists. It included different working groups who were put together to create joint taxonomies to understand the risks associated with uh, AI for the for these two domains. And this led to a series of outputs, including a list of shared uh, definitions for a common approach for understanding and for regulating AI risk. So I think this provides a very interesting case where you've seen uh, countries working together, using science diplomacy to achieve something in the field of AI. Not necessarily in contrast, but a different example is United Nations initiatives on trying to create a similar framework for thinking about AI regulation and for how we want AI, AI to look like. Uh, one of the main initiatives included in this is the High Level Advisory Board on AI, which published a series of reports over the last two years, which, like many UN reports, had lofty conclusions, broad conclusions about the desire to make AI be shaped for the public good, but didn't necessarily include many of those technical um, key points which the Trade and Technology Council included. So what is one potential takeaway from this is that when there is a similar alignment in values, in approach between countries as there is between the US and the EU on this in terms of viewing AI uh, as a AI regulation as a risk management tool, there is scope for science diplomacy to play a role and to be able to shape uh, those outcomes. And how has this been received? I mean, is this only like the US and the EU? Because you just mentioned um, the, the, the connection and the, the, the output. What about other countries? So different countries have different approaches. Right. Uh, the United Kingdom, where I work, has taken a much more hands-off approach to regulation and trying to see a little bit more what can happen with AI innovation. Uh, you have also seen other initiatives uh, spring up so there was a, a, an interesting uh, event in Montreal, I forget the name of it, uh, two months ago, which scientists in AI came together to sort of create a bit of a joint, um, I think it was a joint memorandum on AI risk as well. So there's been different initiatives. I think what makes the EU and the US interesting in this case is that they've both taken a risk management approach to AI regulation, which I think is a bit unique in this field. Okay. Thank you very much. I think this relates directly to Yuko. Um, let's hear about your chapter on Japan's strong commitment to science diplomacy. Japan plays a significant role in shaping the global regulatory framework for AI, focusing on ensuring ethical and human-centered developments and maybe peace and security. Please tell us more about your findings, especially um, concerning the most recent discussions in Japan or the turbulent, rather turbulent times um, looking at the recent elections this week. And how is Japan dealing? Thank you very much. And uh, I'm following my previous speakers because you mentioned EU and US and in between. And you have UK, but also we had Japan. So I was focusing with my colleague Rene Karat, working in chapter, focusing on Japan positioning within this framework of new frontier, which is AI. But uh, the, the positioning is that we, s we found something new in the Japanese approach, because uh, science diplomacy is quite familiar within Japanese context. And it's not so new. But the way tackling AI is new for us. So I will explain to you how it's new. Because it's not just advancement of technology that is a challenge, as usual. But given the impact on society and social system and the way we impact among us is so huge that we have to have new approaches to tackling AI. So 
uh, Japan was um, preparing some kind of ground for discuss on these issues because in 2016, we have launched new concept it called Society 5.0. Just to make a link with Germany, you have been ex really exploring uh, Industry 4.0 before Society 5.0. But I had a discussion with a uh, German high official uh, that it's not just the distinction be between industry and society, but we share the same view in that new technology will be shaping future society. And what we need to do is really focusing not on the technology by sea, but on society, which society we like to have in the future. And uh, this will be really um, designed and shaped by technology, and in particular, with the digital technology, which, which include AI. So by proposing this concept, uh, we said we have to focus more on society itself, and in particular, having human-centered approach to this. So this grant has been very prepared in 2016, and now today, 2024, we see very high AI, and uh, not just in the future, but today we have to really prepare the ground for the discussion. And having the discussion between two poles, we need to have a common ground for that. And Japan was focusing and working on to make sure that we have shared view for the future, in the same time that finding something basic principle common to EU, US, and Japan, and other countries. So that's why last year, when we had a presidency of G7 meeting, Japan proposed to have as a main issue to be tackled, AI framework. So from this, we have launched to have Hiroshima process, and it is not just <coughs> a paper, uh, ongoing work, and the, 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 the intention is not just limiting in G7 country, but gathering, uh, finding friends of countries to make sure that we are moving in the <coughs> global level. So the action that Japan has tackled was quite new approaches in the sense that not just national level or international competition and collaboration, but uh, trying to capture uh, the interest of many, as many as possible of countries to share the vision for the future society. Thank you very much. I was wondering, um, can, how can this action plan be a prototype beyond G7? You just mentioned that you are reaching out for other nations, of course, and then there's the EU, EU and then there's the USA, and they also have certain s regulatory frameworks and uh, action plans. How do you convene, how, you to con how do you convince them after all that your plan is the right one? It's really diplomacy. <laughs> we have to relate to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and at the same time uh, opening the door, not only limited to the block type of approaches, and that's why we are open to the any countries to really sharing the view of this Hiroshima process. And uh, we will plan to have a summit next year in February uh, to gather first wave of friends in view of expanding the friends. At the same time, uh, in our chapter, we focus on the Council of Europe's approaches uh, for AI convention. And this was really an uh, interesting framework because not only focusing uh, in Europe, but we have many observer countries uh, in which Japan was present, US was present, uh, in the way that we have really um, open discussion and to find a common uh, goals. And then uh, the, the approach of convention is that you are not imposing uh, any type of law or soft law, but you can adopt in your context, in the national level uh, framework, but at the same time, we have the shared value for that. And uh, the ideas being that it's opening the 
members joining this convention. So we see now two channel uh, opening the door to other countries and now time is to convincing them and then having larger as a larger as possible. Okay. Thank you very much for these insights. Now, uh, Annette, I have a question to you. Um, looking at your program and your um, educational approaches, what do you? Th uh, how is your impression on the younger generations? Do they still do they ha have the same enthusiasm for science diplomacy, or do they look rather maybe skeptical into the future? Um, yeah, I think it's. Um so the younger generation, I, I, I noticed um, you, we cannot generalize the younger generation because I've been running this program for 12 years now and I noticed that in these 12 years the students have changed. Um, that, that was really uh, m very eye-opening for me that we cannot generalize, oh, it's Generation Z or Generation X. Um, it, it's really, I almost say that these day and age, the, um, the changes are so fast that we really have to look at every single year individually. Um, they are, for the most part, I think the current generation that's currently 18, 19, 20, that generation is very global, but you also mustn't forget that this is the generation that experienced COVID. So globalization was coming to a halt. So I think we must not underestimate the value of uh, travels and uh, the stress of um, the parent generation during COVID what influenced their stress. So this, this generation, while globally, um, um, seen very open and willing to travel. Th they are more stressed about world um, events than others. I noticed um, they are also less resilient, um, which makes sense because they were doing COVID 14, 15, 16, and that is the time when you really build up resilience and, 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 and strength. So they did not have that opportunity, and they were surrounded through very stressed out parents too, or environments, um, and even governments, and nobody knew what to do. So this um, unstructured, um, uh, this unstructured year or years during COVID made a huge difference to these students that they lost a lot of trust in the government and maybe even to science if they heard it from their um, older parents. So I think what we need to do cautiously, not generalize the current generation in, in one big block, but also look at what they have they experienced, what came into, um, what was important during their um, upbringing. So the, the COVID generation is a column um, we really need to um, take look at them separately. The generation before COVID, I, I would say they are very globally oriented, is a very um, um, environmentally sensitive um, um, uh, generation, uh, very um, open to uh, new ideas and very easily to excite about a new vision. Um, as I said, the current generation with the experience COVID is uh, less likely, but they're also very dependent, and it makes sense, they're very dependent on social media and, and um, influences from outside, and we have, I work at Columbia University, so most of you know what happened. So I think um, the, the impact of, of that, that they are so dependent on social media for, for this particular generation, we must not forget. So we'll have to see what happens to the next generation in the next two, three years, um, how young people um, will approach globalization, internationalization, how can we help them becoming global citizen physicians or students and, and professionals, because we're not just work, talking about physicians, and my experience is with health profession students. Um, I think the other thing that we also need to, when we look at the younger generation, we also need to look at the the generation that teaches them, what role models are we um, preparing or what, what are we offering to them, who can they look up to and who are they collaborating with. So I think the teachers need to be included into science diplomacy and most of us, my generation included, we don't know much about science diplomacy, we don't know much about the skills we need to teach the students and we don't really have this um, very open mindset of saying, you know, don't worry about the borders, you know, just, just work together um, and um, don't compete. And, and always, you know, I, one of my professors when I was a poster once told me, don't be afraid someone steals your idea because if this was your last idea, you are in trouble anyways. And I think that makes a lot of sense because this anxiety about someone will steal my idea, I will not ever share my knowledge with other people, makes it really hard to promote science diplomacy because of all this competition that's going on. That's a very peaceful approach after all because isn't science all about competition as well? 
Isn't science all about uh, competition? It shouldn't, yeah, it shouldn't. I, I really, my personal opinion, because I was a scientist, um, as a, as a global community, you can reach a lot more. And I think the way how we have structured our science um, around getting grants and getting support and uh, centering our survival by financial support by being the only one or being the one who's leading a field have really created an atmosphere and a culture of competition that is really harmful for us as a human um, group because our man, our our brains is a total, as a, as a whole community, we, we can do a lot more together in a group rather than individually. Um, and I think this is also in line what Christian is doing with, with AI, because AI now gives you the opportunity to, to bundle all the knowledge that's around the world um, and not to be afraid of, of, of um, competition and someone stealing your ideas because it's right there, it's in the database. Um, so, so I think um, I in a sense um, we should maybe start looking at science from a different um, perspective rather than a co um, competitive way to look at, uh, move away from the competition and the market model, meaning who's the leader, who gets the best students, who has makes the most money, and who has the most power in this world, to a more uh, liberal model um, approach when we look at how can, what can we do to collaborate so we really can prevent diseases, we can cure uh, certain diseases, how can we make sure that the health of our people is ensured, and that is across all economic um, um, backgrounds. Thank you very much. Now, Sumi, I have also a question to you. Um, concerning uh, your findings uh, about um, disaster resilience diplomacy, um, don't I was assuming, don't you get a lot of support for such a subject? And there must be a lot of common ground and consensus to tackle these challenges. Uh, why diplomacy? I mean, there must always, like, there, I feel there must be a lot of consensus uh, after all. Uh, yes. Um, Y yes, but I think As that... As the Germans say, you <laughs> must run into, uh, into open doors, uh, in a way. I mean, uh, do you have any... I, I think we are still stuck uh, in a conventional way of doing things, right? Um, so I think the humanity or the life-saving uh, imperative, definitely, you know, you can relate to that. You can bring people together. But unless we, we change the way we do things, we are still in silo. So science community may not be speaking to humanitarian community yet on technology or the use of it in disasters, for example. So in a way, I think we we'll go back to this, um, the, the, the frame of this conversation, science diplomacy in the context of emerging technologies. What is different now than the science diplomacy in the past? Right? And I think there are um, th th these conversations and also the previous panels touched upon sort of the democratizing effect of the emerging technology in the current science diplomacy. It opens doors, as you say, right, to the private sector um, and also like other players. I mean, diplomacy used to be the domain of intergovernmental institutions and national governments. Now we have actually a lot you know, wider players uh, on the scene, but we haven't quite figured out how to work together. And uh, that has been the running theme from this panel to the previous ones. What are your partner countries right now? Because disaster management is needed pretty much everywhere, I would say. Partner, part what are your partner countries like? In wh which, uh, where are your scientific partners in in the world? What are your partner countries? In terms of because everybody uh, needs disaster management. Absolutely, and I think that of course the European countries they have very advanced the, like the remote sensing technologies. Use that for the uh, for the, uh, the disaster detection and early warning. But we have different frameworks, different ways. Yeah, um, the, the Europeans apparently they their for example their early warning systems are quite different from the Japanese. And I'm not saying that we should standardize. I think it's actually okay to have diversity. But I, I think we need to definitely compare notes more. Um, and I don't think that's happening quite yet. Oh, okay, I see. Well, thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned, I would like to include just maybe briefly um, some concerns regarding sci research security, which is uh, obviously closely connected to questions on science diplomacy and AI. Some argue, for example, that AI-based uh, systems pose new risks, such as cyber security threats, or unequal access to technologies, and therefore will divide us more than it actually unites us. So maybe a question to all of you. Given that science diplomacy has become a powerful tool for mitigating geopolitical tensions and fostering trusted relationships, how can it play a role in shaping AI and maybe overcome threats like 
um, ethical concerns in the future? Francesco. I can tell you are eager to answer this. I want to say, uh, space is a, a, a very interesting domain where we are trusting, uh, as a fourth dimension, we are trusting part of our future. But also, uh, stakeholders are preparing to get in the hands on, on what is coming, right? So the militarization of space or the weaponization of space and the resources that are there is, is, is a, a sparking a race uh, for for that, um, so um, maybe because my background is in international relations and, and and my domain is power relationship, I am less optimist than most of my colleagues in in the panel. I see a, a fierce competition is coming, and I I I, I appreciate that science diplomacy as a mechanism can help to reduce that tension, but the the future scenario that is coming is the fight for resources, at least in space, the fight for resources, the new stakeholders involved, especially uh, you talk about in the, the, the previous panel, you talk about uh, the private sector and the role the private sector is gonna have. But still the space is, is driving by governments. And there is a, 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 an increase here on the earth, there is an increase in the in geopolitical tensions and that is 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 becoming this much harder and much complex, right? So uh, what I'm gonna say is ethical aspects are relevant. Um, I, I would like to say that this is driving the future in the space activities. Unfortunately, I don't see that this happening at this point. I see more different stakeholders trying to compete and in the best way compete. There are, there are different scholars talking about the, the, the line between competition and conflict is so thin that we need to pay attention to that. In that sense, a space diplomacy or science diplomacy can play a role in order to reduce what is apparently is coming. Right. Christian, what's your approach to this? So I think there's three broad, and emphasis on the word broad, pathways forward for AI, regula <coughs> AI regulation in this world. One is you see a scenario where you see states regulating uh, together AI policy, building on, for instance, those initiatives that I mentioned earlier. A second option is where you basically see little regulation, a more la laissez-faire approach. You let the private sector develop and you kind of see what happens. And then a third is that you do see regulation, but you see regulation within blocks, within groups of like-minded countries and there is very little overlap between them on the AI systems and on those regulations. And I think if we look at the, if we look at AI policy globally today, I think we see signs for each of these three outcomes being the case. And I think it's a little unclear which pathway the world will sort of ultimately take. One factor though that is different uh, with AI from other fields when we talk about policy is that the private sector in AI plays an enormous role. That's where the technology is being developed predominantly. That is where a lot of the technical expertise is both developed but also ho uh, housed. And the private sector is gonna be playing a very pivotal role in shaping the way that AI regulation takes place globally. And one sort of comparative example that I was sort of thinking about is there are some fields where you've seen a similar large role of the private sector. I'm thinking, for example, about the energy sector, especially a few decades ago, where private sector firms played a very significant role in contributing to the thinking of policy in those fields. And I, I don't know sort of what the answer to that is, but I think that's an interesting comparative example for policymakers and for scholars to think about of what are the parallels between, for example, a case like that and the role of the private sector in AI today? So those are a few thoughts on, on this question. Well, thank you very much. You, do you, would you like to add something? Um, there are so many debates today and discussion and the forum for discussing AI regulations. But all of them are taking as an exception the field of security. So it's outside the scope of the discussion today. So the challenge will be how we may initiate seriously 
and in a collaborative way, the topics of security related to AI regulation. And as we know, it's national level challenges, but what will be needed, it's international level discussion and some kind of framework for that. Usually, in this case, United Nations are there to tackle these challenges. And it's some parts, it's not zero. They have some debate, but it's really a small part of AI challenges. So we should be very uh, innovative, uh, find a new frontier in the way to tackle these discussions. And till now, we do not have any appropriate space for that. So it's a bit um, homework for all of us to find some new way. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you very much. What about you, Annette? Um, yeah, I, I think I have two thoughts about when I heard your question. Is One is, what is AI? <laughs> I mean, how, what's the definition of AI? Because I did a study very recently, that we just published it, that we asked medical students about their preparedness for AI in their practice. and. Uh, what we didn't realize is that every single student seemed to have a different understanding what AI is. And I think that's also something we need to, as a community, come to a consensus. What is AI? Because AI is nothing new, right? I mean, it's, it's been around for several decades and people have been using it in banking and other um, areas of, of, um, of pr uh, daily life almost. And even the internet is somewhat AI, right? I mean, if you think about it, it's a conglomerate of, of data. And if you think about the medical profession, we have been using AI or big data for many, many years. This is how we got to find out about diseases and epidemiology and, and, um, and uh, diseases uh, prevention, risk factors and things like that. So this is, has been always been around. So we need to come to a consensus. What do we, what do we think is AI? What is different in AI now that um, compared to what we used to have already or what do we have already? And then the second thing is, um, the question about ethics, um, I think it's really worthwhile looking at the fields that have been using AI for a very long time and see what regulations did they have or didn't they have and what trouble in what uh, areas that went they got into trouble for because we might have um, concerns about ethics that may never come to realization because we might not have to have, we might not need to worry about it and I'm thinking about uh, pharmaceutical companies collecting data from patients um, that are anonymized and they're using that. Is that something we need to be concerned about, that uh, pharmaceutical companies have access to that, um, if we tell them, you know, you, or biotech companies? Um, the question is really uh, to what extent do we want to prevent what? And I think that's something we need to, as a community of people who are interested in AI and science diplomacy, come to a conclusion of, okay, this is something we really need to regulate and this is not something we don't have to um, worry about, uh, rather than saying, okay, we need to come up with some ethical guidelines and follow certain guidelines that other fields have been, um, or in, that are in daily life, data protection, privacy issues. Um, do we really need to worry about that or not? Seems like a pretty urgent homework to do, in a way. <laughs> Sumi. Thank you. I mean, with all that's happening today in the world, how many, how many of you think that we are the turning point of humanity? Right? I mean, seriously. AI is going to stay, technology is going to stay, climate change is going to stay. This is a defining moment, and we need to shape the future together. And I, I mean, it sounds like a naive, but I, I do think that the crisis does present an opportunity. I left the UN two years ago because I saw and I thought, and I'm convinced that the old diplomacy doesn't work anymore. But we actually, yeah, we need to really sort of, um, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> I, I, have, I, have, I have friends here. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly, like-minded friends. Um, but we still have to um, redefine, I mean, you have to imagine the future based on the reality that we have today and we have to shape the future together. And I think you know, education is a great tool um, in, in that sense. Um, I, I think we are identifying issues, and, but I think we need to sort of um, come to that sort of courageous conversation about what the future will look like 10, 15, 20 years, years from now, and 50, and then 100, and then sort of step back and, and have the conversations on, on that. And I think that way we probably may be able to change the framework from competition to cooperation or survival together. 
Well, these were pretty perfect last words. There's nothing to add, I guess. We all agree. Um, Jan, how are we doing? We are only one step ahead of Twig or Treat and the beer, I guess. 20 minute summary. I hope you're all ready. No. <laughs> um, but Maria Havik and I would like to maybe take a moment and take the pulse in the room. We have a reception upstairs on the eighth floor. Um, so if you agree, we would um, do a couple of questions uh, from the audience and perhaps rather than the two of us summarizing uh, what we've heard and the many uh, deep thoughts and the depth and breadth of discussion uh, to rather continue that upstairs during the reception. How does everybody feel about that? Okay, I think Muriel, our polling worked this time uh, old fashioned, the old fashioned way, but let's dive into a couple of audience questions. How can disaster resilience technologies be leveraged within diplomatic frameworks to encourage cross-border collaboration? I think, Sumi, this is for you. How can disaster resilience technology be leveraged? I think this is where we, again, we need to collect more stories and concrete examples and showcase um, you know, the, the, the power of the storytelling that I think we talked about a little earlier, that, um, yeah, we need evidence. When we, again, as I, I, I alluded to it, we, we have that we can, we showcased, we have showcased what the technologies can do, but we have not showcased yet what has changed because of these technological advancements. And I think we need to do more case studies, and I think this is where social science frameworks um, and the methodologies that can, can meet with the scientific or uh, science diplomacy conversations that we, we have evidence, um, build a story, and, and then be able to relate um, to, to the, to the, the um, like-minded friends and, 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 and other partners. Thank you, Sumi. Um, how about how do you how do you, how do science diplomacy with how do you do science diplomacy with countries with fundamentally different normative perspectives? I'll take a stab at it. I think it's a really difficult question, but I think for many of you who are diplomats in the room, I know there's people here from the State Department. Diplomatic breakthroughs seem impossible until the moment that they are possible. And I think that's true as well for things like cooperation on AI between countries which have fundamentally different normative perspectives. If you do the work you have, try and maintain contacts and conversations, there can be openings in the future where those different normative approaches might narrow quite a bit and there is then an opportunity and there is scope for some type of common approach to that. That's part of, part of the answer. I think the second part of it is, I do think there are some institutional frameworks which could be created, which could allow for this type of cooperation. I mentioned earlier the high-level advisory board uh, report on artificial intelligence that the United Nations put out. One of the recommendations, which I thought was really interesting and I, I'm, I hope will happen, um, is the creation of something akin to the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which produces scientific reports on climate change, and its impacts and how to mitigate it. And the proposal was to create something similar for artificial intelligence specifically. And I think creating something along those lines would pre create uh, sort of a, a, an international scientific backbone which can help override some of these differences in, in normative approaches over time. So those are two thoughts. Thank you. Sumi. Is it the issue of countries with different normative, normative um, perspectives, or is it the governmental elites of certain countries with the different normative frameworks? Um, because I think there's a, there's a distinction to be made. Um, fundamental human rights, like survival, for example, um, do people disagree with that? Oh, probably not. Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was universal for that reason. I just wanted to may I make a little boy a point, point about, about that, and I had a thought, but I lost it. <laughs> Thank you, Sumi. Uh, a round of applause for our final panel. <laughs> I hope we all piqued your interest in the upcoming edited volume. Uh, please stay tuned. Uh, we've had many partners along the way. Um, 
many of the authors coming from distinguished institutions, but also the German Centers for Research and Innovation's own institutional background. There's a lot of energy in this room. There's a lot of energy in this book project. I'm sure there's, this, there's a lot of energy uh, with all of you who can join us and share with us your own thoughts on science diplomacy during the reception. Um, but there's also, it takes a village to put something like this together. So I want to thank the Devi Ha team, Saskia and Julia. <laughs> and of course, we want to thank Ona, and where's the bag? <laughs> they have some, of course, Ona is our gracious host. Um, here's a little gift. Uh, it's not a gift, we don't give gifts. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ona, for uh, partnering with us, mm -hmm. and um, the future is bright as long as we work together. Uh, thank you also to Muriel Helbig, the Vice President of the German Center for Reser uh, of the German Academic Exchange Service, for being here and traveling. Um, we will now move upstairs to the eighth floor for the reception. Uh, please join us. Uh, the elevators are out front, and um, thank you again for being here, for joining the conversation, and for con continuing the conversation with us. Thank you so much.